Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. May the holy names of Jesus and Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. By looking at the life of a saint, a great Franciscan, who we commemorate today, he's called Saint Ignatius of Laconi. He was a son of pious peasants in a place called Laconi in Sicily, born way back in the year 1701. As a young man, he vowed during a serious illness that if he recovered his health, he would consecrate his life to God and enter the Capuchin, the Franciscan order. He regained his health, but he kept putting off the fulfillment of his vow day by day by day. This is, remember, the temptation of the devil, not wanting anyone to enter into religious life. Then as to warn him, his life was threatened again when he was threatened when a horse he was riding became shy or ran very fastly in danger. Ignatius then called upon St. Francis in this time renewing his vow, which he had previously made, and then again received help. This time his parents raised no objections to entering the religious life. So he asked for admission at the convent in Cagliari, which is in Sicily, but the superiors hesitated at first because of his delicate health. Then Ignatius looked up an influential friend who interceded for him and he was received. The ardor of his soul made him so strong that he could attend all the exercises of the community and even excel his brethren in the perfect observance of the rule. After being employed in the community for several years at various occupations, he was appointed the quester of arms because of his edifying conduct. Don't know what this means, the quest of arms. It means he was appointed to be the head of the, the squad or the friars to beg for providence. The citizens of Cagliari soon realized that Brother Ignatius really gave them more than he took away with him. His modest demeanor was a quiet sermon for all who saw him going about. He seldom spoke. We repeat, he seldom spoke. This was the great silence of this great Franciscan today. But when charity and the salvation of souls required it, he spoke with exceptional kindness. He would also instruct the children and the uneducated, comfort the sick and urge sinners to be converted and to do penance. Mockery and contempt he accepted calmly, replying only with kind words. St. Ignatius was always punctually obeyed his superiors, even when it required the denial of his own will. Not for anything in the world would Brother Ignatius have kept anything from doing his duty. Ignatius often talked about the great love we should have for Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. He took as his model the great Lawrence of Brindisi, who was a veritable furnace of divine love. Not cold, he said, like himself. In the official process of his, of his process to be a saint, Ignatius, it states of Ignatius, he taught little children the catechism and asked them to pray for the exaltation of the church and the spread of the Christian faith. Wherever he stayed at homes in the course of his begging, he spoke of the mysteries of the faith the passion and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the incarnation. He frequently then expressed an intense desire to see the whole world become Catholic. What a beautiful thought then for nowadays also. When he was insulted, he was glad that at least someone knew him for what he was. At long last, he would say, one person in Calvary knows me and calls me what I really am. When others applauded his miracles, he used to say, be quiet, this is the Lord's work. Regarding his humble austerity, his cell had a poor little cot of bare boards 
with the rock for a pillow. And he's worn was a thread boy habit, was of coarse Sardinian wool. With the permission of his religious superior, he wished to wear until death, even though the province had introduced, introduced the habit of finer material. In another letter, Ignatius, the Capuchin superior, painted an accurate picture of this humble lay brother. Only 17 years after his death, he said, this most exemplary religious wore our holy habit from his 20th year of his life. He always led a, a life of ceaseless mortification and won the esteem of all who had good fortune to meet and speak with him. I feel it hardly necessary to call the attention he said to his scrupulous religious observance. This is what we pray for today for all the religious. Scrupulous religious observance to save souls. He was always the first in the choir, not only in his younger days, but even when he was in his 80s. He did not allow his advanced age to excuse him from standing. As was his custom, several hours of the night in the church in continuous contemplation, beautiful. He was a prompt and unquestioning, his was a prompt and unquestioning obedience. It was enough to even just for him to know the mind of his superior to carry out their will, whatever it may be. Everybody loved him. He always kept his gaze in his silence fixed on eternity. The strict account he would have to render to the Lord Jesus Christ at the moment of his death and the vanity of the passing world. He knew how to combine incredible fasting, privation of sleep, and continual mortification with the common observance. Despite his infirmity, Ignatius persevered in his arduous work until he was 80 years of age. Even after he became blind, he continued to make his daily rounds for two years. The veneration of the people increased, and many people were miraculously cured by and aided by him. He died then on May the 11th, anniversary, May the 11th, 1781, and many miracles occurred at his grave. He was beatified in 1940 and canonized in 1951. What can we learn then today about this great Capuchin Franciscan. We said he seldom spoke. Many times out in his begging mission then, he seldom spoke. This is the beautiful gift of silence then. We do not need mean silence is the, the lack of words in the worldly sense, but the absence, but silence is standing before the mystery of God and knowing when to speak. Silence is this interior disposition. We need the silence of Mary and Joseph at Nazareth. Not to try to live in interior silence is equivalent to giving up the effort to lead a truly Christian life. The Christian life is a life of faith, lived in the invisible for what is invisible. Anyone who is not constantly in contact with the invisible world runs the risk of remaining always on the threshold of a true Christian life. We think so much of appearances that we are unable to appreciate anything that does not appeal to the senses. Silence, then, is the source when springs effectual effort. The jet of water is forced silently to bore its way through the stone before it is able to burst forth, bubbling into song. It must be well understood that when silence is recommended, it is we speak now of in interior silence, interior silence which should be imposed upon the senses and imagination to avoid the liability of being taken out of ourselves in spite of ourselves at every moment. This beautiful analogy, think of if you work in the kitchen preparing the meals today, if the oven door is perpetually kept open to adopt the simile used by St. Teresa, the heat will no doubt escape. It takes a long while to raise the temperature, but a second is sufficient for it to run down. A crack in the wall will let in the icy outer air, and the whole process has to be begun again. The great Saint 
Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, the first requirement for prayer is silence. People of prayer are people of silence. We repeat, people of prayer are people of silence. Despite the disquieting nature of silence, countless saints have counseled it as necessary and indispensable practice for growing in true holiness. We live in this world. The Prince of Darkness has his moment and his weapon is the noise, is the noise. Nobody wants the silence. I remember one time my sister used to come around to clean a house I lived in. She was not practicing the art of prayer. She saw, she heard the silence in the house and all the statues and the holy pictures and felt uncomfortable. What did she do? She wanted the noise, so she turned for her peace in the world and turned on the television. This is the worldly noise which invades our space in silence and quiet the devout soul advances in virtue and learns the hidden truths of scripture, says Thomas Akempis. Guard against much talking, advises Saint Dodateus, for it puts flight, it puts to flight devout thoughts and recollection in God. And the great Saint Maximilian Kobe declares thus, silence is necessary and even absolutely necessary. If silence is lacking, then he says, grace is lacking. So then in conclusion, be silent, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, before the mysteries of the Lord. Be silent as Mary and Joseph. Speak first to the Lord, especially in the most important moment of the day in the silence. We speak of the 15 minutes of thanksgiving after receiving Holy Communion. This is the most important time to speak to the Lord when you can ask Jesus Christ to marry the desires of your heart and then your joy shall be complete. Stay silent and wait on the Lord Jesus Christ so that he himself will wait for you in silence with your mother Mary at the gates of paradise one day, amen. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary, Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.